uh, Professor Orly Lenovsky to the stage. She is a associate professor of city planning at the University of Manitoba, who has all, and she's also for the last few years been serving as one of our working group co-chairs, T3, there it is, equitable community planning and engagement. So welcome, Orly, very excited to hear uh, about the results of your research on elected officials. Okay, great. And you can see the screen, okay? Yes, that's okay. great, Orly. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to be presenting on some work that we've been doing um, as part of the Mobilizing Justice T3 um, theme. Um, and this work has been done in collaboration with Isabel Cascante, um, who was the theme co-lead, as well as Jennifer Dean at the University of Waterloo and two fantastic students that we had, Samantha Leger, a PhD student at the University of Waterloo, and Abigail McLaren, who is, uh, was a master's student at U of M. Um, so I'm presenting from Winnipeg. Um, I like to think about sort of the land acknowledgement in the context of professional practice, since that's sort of my orientation. Um, so Winnipeg is on Treaty 1 territory. Our water comes from Shoal Lake. Um, and the growth of Winnipeg was made possible by the construction of an aqueduct um, in 1918 that cut off Shoal Lake First Nation um, from the mainland, who then had no accessible uh, access uh, for over 100 years until the Freedom Road was finally constructed in, 19, in 2019. So I like to think about sort of that context of professional practice when we're thinking about where we are and, and our resources. Um, so why the focus on elected officials? Elected officials obviously have a role in setting priority, shaping directions, directing funding. Um, there's really been sort of limited academic literature um, on the role of elected officials on the transportation side, but the literature that is there um, often talks about sort of a mismatch between um, the orientation of transportation experts and professional planners and elected officials sort of more broadly. Um, and there's really very little known about elected officials in the Canadian context, specifically about transportation equity. So if we want to ensure that transportation investments are more equitable, I think we really need to think about the values and perspectives of elected officials and strategies for ensuring that equity is prioritized at sort of all levels of decision makers. Um, so in terms of our broad objectives, we wanted to understand elected officials' values and their knowledge of transportation equity, um, but we also wanted to know about their own experiences with transportation. We know that people often draw on their own experiences to understand the world around them, so we wanted a better understanding of their personal experiences, such as if they, had, they or someone close to them had ever faced or face, continued to face a transportation barrier. And then the second objective um, was about understanding the type of information or expertise they use to make decisions. And this part was really aimed at thinking about how do you convey the need to prioritize equity? So thinking about the types of information that's most compelling for elected officials. And I won't go into a lot of depth on that side just for time's sakes, but with everything, we're happy to share our preliminary findings. Um, so there were two parts of this research. The first was a survey that was distributed to all locally elected officials and jurisdictions that had public transit in Canada. Um, so this included mayors, councillors, Reeves, or the, the equivalent. Um, and the survey was on all modes of transportation, but we limited it to jurisdictions that had some form of public transit to allow um, for some level of comparability. Um, and in terms of public transit, we included locations that had some form of public transit, including paratransit, even if the municipality didn't provide it directly themselves. Um, and we know, obviously, that provincial and federal elected officials have significant influence over transportation decision making and funding. But as a first cut, we decided to focus on, on the local level. Um, so the survey really aimed for breadth. Um, across the country. Uh, we then followed it up with in-depth interviews to get a better understanding of some of the nuance in our survey findings. Um, so we interviewed 38 uh, councillors and mayors who had uh, expressed interest in, in speaking more about these issues. Um, so just some background information about the respondents. Um, we had respondents from 165 councillors or mayors, fairly good representation geographically, but certain areas were um, over or underrepresented. The, the two main ones were British Columbia, about 32% of the responses, but only 
14% of the population, so overrepresented. Um, and Quebec is underrepresented. Uh, the survey was distributed in English and French, and we conducted interviews as well in English and French as, as um, uh, suggested by the participants. We also didn't have responses from uh, three provinces and two territories. Um, so an interesting aspect on focusing on elected officials is sort of the range of community sizes they represent. Um, about 25% of our respondents represented small communities with less than 15,000 um, community members. And in this uh, diagram here, you can see the gray shaded bars represent the actual distribution of elected officials by community size, which comes from another national survey of local officials, the Canadian Municipal Barometer. Um, so you can see that our respondents pretty closely reflect the actual distribution by community size, although we do have overrepresentation at the larger end of municipalities, um, over 100,000. Um, uh, fewer responses from newly elected officials. The majority had over five years experience as an elected official and the majority were councillors rather than mayors. And then lastly, we asked if they identify as part of an equity deserving group. Um, you can see here sort of that distribution out of 165 participants, only eight identified as racialized um, or LGBTQ, four participants identified as indigenous or as a, a newcomer immigrant or refugee. The largest group were seniors and then women, and then you can see about 22% that didn't identify as part of any um, equity deserving group. Um, we also asked travel related questions. We were interested in sort of what their personal travel behaviors were, travel to work to align with the census questions. And you can see here sort of the differences in community size for travel to work. I should also clarify that work doesn't necessarily mean their work as elected officials in smaller communities, often it's part time work. Um, on council. Overall, the majority drive, um, but really only in the largest communities do you see sort of a closer split between driving and, and other modes. Um, and the majority of respondents of elected officials have a car in their household, about 90% had a car, and the majority own, uh, own or lease a car as well as having a second car. Um, and then we asked if they used any mode uh, in their travel. And here there's sort of more variance, higher rates of walking and, and cycling, although transit is still low under 10% for either daily, weekly, or monthly use um, and no paratransit users. So in terms of the key findings, um, you know, we found sort of limited personal experience with transportation barriers. Um, the barriers that elected officials see in their communities are related to poor um, public transit and long travel times, both by transit and by um, personal vehicle. Um, and in terms of values, there was sort of broad support for ideas of procedural equity, but much less support for um, the idea of prioritizing equity deserving or marginalized groups. So I'll just go a little bit more into those key areas. Um, in terms of personal experiences, the pink here is for um, the respondents, so elected officials' own experiences. Um, the gray is for someone important to them. So about 30 to 40 percent said that they had a personal experience with a transit-related barrier. Um, two out of the top three top um, personal experiences did relate to transit, not going to locations they needed or general issues. Um, far fewer elected officials had personal experience with disability or affordability barriers, um, but they did say that they had someone um, important to them that had faced uh, those barriers. So over 50% um, had someone close to them that had difficulties affording private transportation costs. Um, and then we were really interested in what they saw as barriers in their communities that their constituents faced. Um, so these are the perceptions of barriers in their community or jurisdiction, and in some respects it mirrors what they identified as personal barriers, such as long travel times um, or issues with public transit. Um, you can see here that some participants felt that there were no transportation barriers in their committees, in their communities. Um, other areas like the cost of transit were not frequently selected, and no participant selected discrimination or safety on transit as the top barrier in their community. And then obviously when you break it down by community size, you see quite a bit of, of differences. In large cities, the cost of car ownership was actually selected um, much more frequently as well as active transportation safety, um, long travel times by car and being unable to reach destinations by public transit were, were much more frequently selected in smaller communities. 
Um, and I will say that all of the participants that selected no barriers in their communities were in um, those smaller communities. Um, and also those in smaller communities selected other, the other option, a write-in option more frequently. Um, and they talked um, about the lack of interurban transit for, for traveling outside of community, winter conditions, issues with um, transit in outlying areas, long distances to, to transit. Um, so then I'll just uh, spend a little bit of time on sort of the values. Uh, we gave them a series of paired choice questions about equity values. They were forced, so they had to choose um, one option and they weren't perfect opposites. Um, we really, I think, worked hard and got a lot of input in terms of thinking about what those options could be so that they would be applicable to elected officials in a range of community sizes. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go through all of them, um, but we had sort of six paired values in different areas. So for example, for procedural fairness, we asked what they agreed with more, that public consultation is only fair if people from different identities and communities are able to fully participate, um, or if they agreed more that if people choose not to participate in public consultation, that doesn't impact the fairness of the process. Um, and I will just say that these sort of last two paired choice ones, um, maintenance of existing conditions and willingness to pay aren't really sort of in theoretical conceptions of equity, but we included them, um, first of all, because they come up very frequently in decision making issues. Um, and then they also align with some very early research that was done on transportation equity and elected officials, and we wanted to see how it lined up. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll, I think, highlight the ones that are important for sort of our understandings. Um, so the one that had the most support uh, towards leaning, I guess, towards a more equitable approach was about maintaining existing conditions. So 84% agreed that for transportation systems to be fair, sometimes changes to existing costs um, or infrastructure are needed versus that they should remain the same as much as possible. And I think this is probably an interesting finding in terms of what some folks might be seeing on the ground in terms of um, reticence or acceptance of changing some of those conditions. Um, as I mentioned before, procedural fairness um, had strong support. So 73% agreed that public consultation is, is only fair if people from different identities and communities are able to fully participate, which was sort of, um, we're happy to see that finding. Um, and then moving on to some of the more mixed results, um, about half and half split for geographic fairness. So 44% of elected officials that responded felt um, that all areas of the city or region should receive similar levels of investment. Um, this is interesting, obviously, because of the majority of ward-based systems in the Canadian context, as well as tying into a lot of the, the political science literature on sort of the motivations of elected officials. Um, and then lastly, um, I think one of the biggest issues that we'll need to address um, is that there was very little support for prioritizing benefits towards marginalized groups, um, which, as many of the folks know here, is really the foundation of academic research on, on transportation equity and I think to a large extent professional practice as well. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into the interview data in great depth, but uh, I think we see a lot of nuance and variation um, in how the counselors define equity and, and think about um, some of these issues. So we followed up on, on our findings from the survey because we were interested in hearing more um, about how counselors thought about these issues. Um, so for this question, we specifically asked about um, that value um, paired question and whether um, that reflected their view. Um, so this is um, an example from one counselor. So they answered, no, not really. I mean, that's just kind of made me sad there for a moment. I view my responsibility as a counselor is to look after the 20%. Uh, realistically, 80% of us can look after ourselves and do the things we want. That's why I'm here is to serve and to help those people that need um, that voice. And I think um, it's really interesting. They sort of uh, ended off on that's really what municipal government is, is all about, providing services and focusing on those that need the greatest amount of help. Um, and then obviously there's quite a bit of variation. So that was a council from a small municipality and sort of a different conception of that to that same question about um, whether that reflected their views. I think I'd say that's practicality, not equity. We do have to balance what's practical with what's equitable. 
And then they give this example. If you have somebody in a wheelchair living in a 1960s neighborhood, you can't grind down every single curb in their neighborhood so they can wheel anywhere they want. That's just the practicalities. You can't just go and do every curb cut for them. I get that it's not equitable for that person, though they can't get around. It's just reality that we can't give them Oops, um, the equity um, that they deserve. Sorry about that. Um, so you can see here sort of a real difference in how counselors think about equity and then how it gets implemented or played out in day-to-day -day decision making. Um, and we are still analyzing our um, interview findings. Um, but I think another interesting aspect that we that we um, are interested in analyzing a bit more is we asked about what are the communities that they feel um, are facing transportation barriers in their in their communities. So again, these are preliminary findings, but in terms of frequency of, of what elected officials were saying, um, a much higher frequency of a focus on accessibility and people with physical disabilities, as well as a focus on um, people who don't have access to a vehicle. In some cases, they discussed more why they wouldn't have access to a vehicle, but that was a common theme. Um, sort of a medium frequency, a focus on age, but really only seniors um, in terms of the data that we've analyzed to this point. Again, it's sort of preliminary and some focus on income. And then right now in sort of the stage of data um, analysis that we're at, very little focus on um, youth, women, people that are racialized, immigrants or newcomers or with indigenous identity. So again, we're in the middle of analyzing that data, but um, we're looking more into sort of how elected officials define communities and, and the barriers that they face. And then I will also say we also asked quite a few questions about how staff can better support elected officials in equitable decision making. And we're hoping that that's going to feed into some concrete strategies um, for professional staff um, planners and engineers and so on. So I'll just finish with some quick reflections on our findings. Um, the majority of direct experiences with transportation barriers were more heavily weighted towards system-wide concerns, such as transit, not going to needed destinations or long commute times. Um, really few of the significant um, concerns identified in the research on transportation barriers, such as affordability, discrimination, and harassment. Um, were ranked as, as concerns by elected officials. Um, I didn't discuss this in depth, but elected officials uh, talked about staff reports quite a bit as their important source of decision-making. So um, as we continue this research, we're really thinking um, about the opportunities for staff to make concerted efforts to ensure that the experiences of equity-deserving communities are prioritized in data collection, analysis, and recommendations to cancel. Um, secondly, oftentimes views on elected officials can lack nuance, particularly in understanding their motivation. So, um, you know, for example, much of the literature focuses on credit claiming or ribbon cutting opportunities as a main factor in how elected officials make decisions. But I think our findings show that elected officials are aware of key transportation barriers and many, not all, are committed to improving equity and outcomes. So obviously there are you know, likely discrepancies between stated values and actions, but I think these findings point to opportunities to improving fairness and equity um, if we operate from a nuanced perspective of working with elected officials. And then lastly, one of the critical findings from this research is I think a significant disconnect between the perspectives of elected officials and academic discourses, um, as well as likely professional discourses on equity. So Academic analysis uh, almost exclusively fa focus on equity deserving groups, whether it's related to race, disability, age, immigrant status, and so on. Um, but only 37% of elected officials agreed that transportation policy should be prioritized to benefit um, equity seeking uh, groups and communities rather than the greatest number of people. Um, I think some of the preliminary data from the interviews points to the need to have more foundational discussions with elected officials about these, about these issues ahead of decision-making processes. Um, as mentioned in the earlier um, presentation, these are normative values and require sort of active engagement in these issues ahead of um, a council vote or, or similar processes. And I think, again, this sort of emphasizes the role for staff and senior leadership to be proactive in addressing equity issues and, and shaping the terms of the debate. Thank you um, so much, yeah. Orly. I need to, I actually need to move us along. I'm so sorry. Um, 
you can leave your slide up uh, as, as we finish off here, but um, thank you so much. I think that your work has been really instrumental in, in, you know, I mean, the academic contribution, but also just to help mobilizing justice, think more clearly about um, how we're going to affect change and different, you know, some of our goals and impacts that we want to have as, as a project. And um, I'm so looking forward to seeing more of the results from the qualitative piece. Um, it just, you've really uh, uh, excited, excited me with those little snippets. So thank you for sharing those. And on 